Funding for this production was made possible in part by Native American Public Telecommunications and the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Jackson Sundown was a quiet and reserved man who was haunted by a war with the U.S. Cavalry in 1877 and who went on to become one of the legendary horsemen of the American Western frontier. George Fletcher was a warm-hearted, free-spirited, and friendly man who came west along the Oregon Trail from Missouri at the turn of the century to a small town in Oregon called Pendleton. Fletcher and Sundown's paths would cross here at the Pendleton Roundup. Like many athletes of color in future years, they proved that ability transcends racial prejudice and they became champions. They won respect and recognition for their daring feats of horsemanship. Fletcher and Sundown are the American Cowboys. In early days, a few cowboys would get together after the herds were round up from the open range to settle boasts about who could ride and rope the best. In Pendleton, Oregon, it was called the Roundup. In Calgary, Canada, the Stampede. In Cheyenne, Wyoming, it was the Frontier Days. In the Southwest, the name Rodeo or Rodeo was more common. As the 19th century came to a close, many areas of the western frontier saw the ending of more rustic lifestyles. The creation of rodeo helped to keep alive the tradition of the American western cowboy. Jackson Sundown was born in 1863. His mother was a member of the Flathead tribe in Montana, and his father was a Nez Perce Indian from the Wallawa Valley of Eastern Oregon. A lot of people talk about Jackson Sundown as a warrior in the war. Some of the research I've looked at suggests that maybe he was a little bit young as a warrior, and maybe in the horse holding stage, you know, a lot of the younger boys did hold horses and, and trade horses with the warriors during the time of war. But of course, even the non-combatants, women and children younger than warrior age were participants because, because it involved the civilians. So everybody experienced fire. Chief Joseph led the Nez Perce retreat against the United States Army and volunteers. In May of 1877, U.S. Army General Howard ordered Chief Joseph to peacefully move the Nez Perce Indians to a reservation in Idaho in 30 days or be placed there by military force. In June of 1877, four Nez Perce warriors who were seeking revenge for slain Nez Perce Indians killed settlers along the Salmon River in Idaho. The Nez Perce War had begun. Sundown and his family were living on the Flathead Reservation in Montana. The Nez Perce Indians had four major armed conflicts with the United States Army and volunteers across Oregon, Washington, Idaho, and Montana. The old warriors said, it wasn't our war. It's not Nez Perce's war. It wasn't Chief Joseph's war. We were trying to avoid the war. We wanted to 
stay away from the war. Nobody in their right mind wants the United States Army coming down on their villages full of women and children. And if you analyze the battles that were fought, each one at Whitebird, June 17th, 1877, the village is set up in the creek bottom along Whitebird Creek. The Army attacks. Of course, the Army lost that battle. The Battle of the Clearwater, the village was set up along the South Fork of the Clearwater River. General Howard attacked from above and the people defended themselves and they won a, a strategic victory there. At least they were able to escape the army. They went over the Lolo Pass. They fought several little skirmishes getting over Lolo Pass. Then of course the terrible tragedy of the Battle of the Big Hole. On August 8, 1877, as daylight broke across the eastern sky, U.S. Army Officer Lieutenant John Gibbons gave the order to cavalry soldiers and volunteers under his command to advance on the Nez Perce village. And uh, early in the morning, there's an old man that was there, half blind. And um, he woke up real early, he wanted to go check on the horses. So he left his, his teepee, he left his lodge, and he went towards the water. He moved right into the soldier positions, the volunteer section, they opened fire and they killed him. And the attack was on. The soldiers came across the water, and they did as told. They shot low into the teepees, three volleys moved, three volleys and moved. In fact, Chief Whitebird was there yelling at the warriors, yo, fight, you young warriors that wanted this war. Now is the time to fight. Look before us, our women and children are being killed in front of us. lodges, one of those teepees. The sundown was inside there as a young boy. He always spoke of this. He's inside the teepee with his brother. He's, he was holding his brother, trying to protect him. He was scared. The bullets, they said, came in just like rain would fall on canvas. It's how fast the bullets hit the, the teepees. And all of a sudden, a, a shell came through and killed his little brother that was below him. He got scared, naturally. He ran out, and he ran right into the arms of a soldier instead of killing him. What he'd done is that he picked him up, covered him up with a blanket or a coat or something, and led him outside the perimeter of the fighting and put him down in the grass. You know, a lot of the soldiers in that time period, you know, they were caught with their own beliefs. But uh, it, it, was, it was interesting. It was a terrible battle. But that's probably one of the early times in the Nespers campaign that we know where sundown you know, was there. 119. Nez Perce Indians, soldiers, and volunteers lost their lives at the Battle of Big Hole in Montana. The Nez Perce chiefs decided to join Lakota Indians and Chief Sitting Bull in Canada. On September 30th, 1877, Colonel Nelson Miles ordered his soldiers to attack on the Nez Perce village at Bear Paws in Montana, the Nez Perce Indians could see the wall of soldiers and horses thundering down upon the encampment. The Nez Perce Indians opened fire on the charging soldiers. The Battle of Bear Paws in Montana was a five-day siege. On October 5, 1877, Chief Joseph surrendered to General Howard and Colonel Miles. Arthur Chapman, an Indian interpreter, was present and recorded Chief Joseph's words. Tell General Howard I know his heart. What he told me before, I have it in my heart. I am tired of fighting. Our chiefs are killed. Looking Glass is dead. Tuhulultsot is dead. The old men are all dead. It's the young men who say yes or no. He who led the young men is dead. It is cold and we have no blankets. The little children are freezing to death. My people, some of them, have run away to the hills and have no blankets, no food. No one knows where they are, perhaps freezing to death. I want to have time to look for my children and see how many of them I can find. Maybe I shall find them among the dead. Hear me, my chiefs, I am tired. My heart is sick and sad. From where the sun now stands, I will fight no more forever. 
Arthur Chapman, Indian interpreter. Sundown escaped to Canada and found exile with the Lakota in Saskatchewan. He moved into the lodge of Chief Sitting Bull, who had defeated General Custer at the Battle of Little Bighorn in 1876. Sundown lived among the Lakota and with Sitting Bull in Canada until 1879. Sundown returned to the United States in secrecy, hiding from bounty hunters and soldiers who killed Nez Pierce escapees returning to the United States for the bounty on their scalps. He lived on the Flathead Indian Reservation in Montana, which is where he became known for his horsemanship. In 1889, Sundown took an allotment of land on the Nez Pierce Indian Reservation. He built a log cabin and began breaking horses to make a living. Weyakin is a Nez Pierce word for your spiritual power. The Nez Pierce believed that Sundown's Weyakin was his power and ability to be one with the horses. I heard one story that, that showed how his horsemanship was related to his native religion. As you're probably aware, a lot of young Indian people, men and women alike, were sent out into the wilderness. I once heard one time from this one individual, you know, that uh, his wayakan was, was the horse fly. You know, the wayakan, you know, a lot of people wonder how that works. And uh, how our people used to do that years upon years ago, they'd go in the mountains to fast for five days and five nights. They'd go up there and they'd, and they'd sing their song, they'd prepare themselves, make themselves humble, make themselves pitiful to, to our Creator's things that He made for us all around, things of nature, the trees, and that's where some of the, the differences that we have in one Indian religion versus Christianity that we believe, a lot of the Indian religions believe that everything has life, and everything, even goes a step further, has a soul. And that's what we're looking for when we go in the mountains to fast for these five days and five nights. And sundown again probably went through that, because as I said before, his wayak and his, his medicine, you might say, was, was the horse fly. And in a little buckskin bag, tied behind his ear in one of his braids, was this little uh, lachlui, it's called a lachlui, it's a horsefly. What this meant was that a horse could only get rid of a horsefly by going over backwards, and that the only time that Jackson Sundown would ever be thrown from a horse is if the horse physically threw himself over on his back. And so his Wyakin power was something that gave him the ability to transform himself into a being that couldn't be thrown from a horse. I think it was an integral part of him. I think it's who he was at the time he was riding. Jackson Sundown would place dimes in his stirrups, and he would do his complete ride, and at the end of the ride, those dimes would still be in the stirrups, showing just an incredible and superb control in the saddle on a bucking horse. And so he'd sit up on that horse just like a, I mean, just beautifully, sit up there, and uh, was so relaxed, like as if he knew the horse, he knew the horse, and he'd sit up there, and he'd get, he'd get what they call a lick going. A lick means to just like this, like dancing, whew, 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 with his hand up here, whew. and and the horse. I I don't know. The horse must have felt it too. So they snubbed this horse up to a gentle saddle horse out in the chute with a blindfold over his eyes, and some white guy was going to saddle him, and Sundown said, "No, I'll saddle him." He put his saddle on himself. <laughs> fixed it to suit him, and he was tall, real tall, slim and slender. Just stuck his toe in the stirrup and stepped on, and 
got his rein just right, and he reared back, and he said, turn him loose. I can see that, I can see that horse yet, you know. About the second jump, those braids come out of his shirt here, those long braids that long, and they were just hanging out behind, just snapping like whips like that, you know. Every jump, and, and he never he never missed a lick with those spurs. He was getting him every, every jump, and you could just see the air fly. <laughs> Boy, it was, it was something. Well, the crowd just went wild. They screamed and roared and hollered and throwed money in the arena. There was silver dollars those days. There wasn't no dollar bills. They just throwed silver dollars out there in the arena, and the rest of the rodeo crew and the cowboys, they went around and got their hats and went around and picked that money up and give it to Sundown, and he made twice as much money as the guy that won first in the bucking contest. <laughs> I was the greatest buck and horse ride I ever saw. George Fletcher was an African-American who was born in St. Mary's, Kansas in 1890. Fletcher came west along the Oregon Trail from Missouri with his mother and stepfather at the turn of the 20th century. The Fletcher family settled in eastern Oregon in the small western town of Pendleton, population 6,000. Pendleton's Golden Empire was the 200,000 acres of wheat fields that surrounds the town and produces 4 million bushels of wheat in any year. Pendleton was the trading post for local cattlemen, cowboys, and sheep herders. George Fletcher's stepfather worked for the Pendleton Hotel as a train porter. His mother cleaned homes and stores in town. The Pendleton Hotel provided the Fletcher family a small one-room wooden shack to live in by the train station. As a teenager, Fletcher worked in saloons and bars, running beer and whiskey to the cowboys in the town's brothels. The saloon owners and prostitutes paid him well for his services. That was before a Presbyterian minister condemned Fletcher for his participation in these establishments. There is some mystery surrounding the circumstances of Fletcher's family, which is still unresolved today. We know that George didn't stay with his family too much uh, in his youth, and we don't know what happened to the family except that we can guess and we can imagine that uh, a young black boy coming into this area didn't have black friends. Uh, he probably was discriminated against by the white families and he found friendships among the Indians. Fletcher eventually was taken in by the minister who educated him in English math, reading and writing. He lived and worked at the church on the Umatilla Indian Reservation. We know that uh, he had a good background, a good education, and was brought up right. The local Indians of the Umatilla Indian Reservation adopted Fletcher into their tribes. But he chose to stay here and got acquainted with a uh, few Indians. And uh, eventually lived with them. He lived among good Indians, good Indian families, uh, Indian chiefs, and other uh, better families among the Indians, including uh, people like Clarence Burke and Chief Luke Kalpu, uh, the Wild Bill family. He was practically raised by them because he was very young then. Fletcher learned the culture, hunting, language, and traditions of the Indians. He had lived among the, the Indian people up here, and a lot of local people knew of him. I think he just became a part of, the, part of the tribe, part of the people here. Everybody knew him. And he really talked Chinook. That's kind of half 
English, half Indian, a little bit of everything. And he knew a lot of the Indian language. I remember my dad telling the story one time they were talking about him and he knew what they were saying. <laughs> Because, you know, they thought he didn't understand, but he, he understood the language. Fletcher learned to break horses from the Cayuse, Umatilla, and Walla Walla Indians. They respected the horse that was a part of their culture and way of life. He was involved in in the horse roundups there every spring. And that's where he learned how to ride. Tell him to go out and catch your own horse and get the one you want and that'll be your horse. And that's what he did. He had to break that horse and be chasing wild horses with it in the next few days. The old chiefs trained Fletcher how to break horses without killing the spirit of the animal. He learned to become one with the horse by feeling the movements of the muscles in the direction of the horse's head and ears. The Indians believed George Fletcher found his way again, his power, his way in life. George didn't make it to the first roundup in 1910. Uh, we understand that he was in jail. And there's a little story behind that. Fletcher, a young African-American cowboy, took a bet that he could ride another cowboy's horse across town and back. Many local cowboys had tried to break that particular animal in the past, but with no luck. Fletcher mounted in the saddle and made the wildest ride he ever made tearing up Main Street in the process. Sheriff Till Taylor arrested Fletcher for riding on the sidewalk. As I understand, he won the bet, but uh, there must have been uh, a little damage and problem from this because he was thrown in jail and spent the next day or two there. So uh, he didn't make the first Pendleton Roundup. George Fletcher worked in Pendleton, where he encountered racism from the community. George Fletcher was a person who was around a lot, and did a lot of work, made it his livelihood, and encountered this on a daily basis. And in fact, they, they even labeled a racist name on him. They called him Nigger George. A lot of people called him that right to his face. And um, today, you wouldn't even say that uh, even on film. Sheriff Till Taylor hired George Fletcher as his one-man posse, an unofficial deputy. Fletcher and Taylor tracked criminals with legendary success. We can't hardly imagine now of things uh, happening like they did, but uh, people like George were among the first to open up uh, various competitions to uh, blacks and other races. and. Uh, we need to pay tribute to people like him for, uh, for opening it up. George Fletcher and Jackson Sundown. Their lives would come together in competition at the 1911 Pendleton Roundup. Uh, the Roundup had its beginnings in uh, 1910, its official beginnings. Prior to that time, why, after harvest, so to speak, why a lot of the local guys uh, would go down about where the roundup grounds are now and they'd play baseball and they'd buck a few horses and, and uh, the Indian people would bring in a few horses and they'd have some races. And uh, finally one day, uh, a bunch of forward thinking people uh, thought we ought to have something better than that, uh, something on the order of a fair or, or a, a rodeo. In 1910, in the small western town of Pendleton, Oregon, Roy Raley, with businessmen and community leaders, established the Northwestern Frontier Exhibition Association to stage a western show, The Roundup.
Well, the word spread like wildfire, and uh, they amazed the, even themselves because uh, about 10,000 people showed up. But the town swells to about three times its size during Roundup and makes it, it's an exciting event. Everybody in town gets involved whether they like it or not. There, it's, it's just too big to ignore. It's a premier rodeo. It's an unspoiled rodeo. In other words, I don't mean this derogatorily, but there's no advertising in the arena at all. It's unique in the fact that the field is green, it's grass. It's the only grass arena in the United States. We have a Westward Ho Parade, which is the largest non-mechanized parade in the world. There are no, no motors in the parade whatsoever, not even a lawnmower. Because of the traditional way we run the rodeo, uh, as you know, uh, pedaling uh, is put on by about 500 volunteers. That's all the way from the president of the roundup on down to the last guy sweeping the steps off in the grandstand. Everybody's a volunteer. There are no paid people there. Pendleton, Cheyenne, Calgary, and the big shows own their own rodeo stock. They uh, uh, own their own bucking horses. It's about the only sport that I can think of in America that actually came from their uh, a person's work. In other words, it, it was an extension of what they did every day at, out on the ranch. It's one of the three prestige rodeos in North America. There's Cheyenne, there's Calgary, and there's Pendleton. Thousands of people came on special trains to the Roundup. Many came by the OR and N and Northern Pacific Railroad trains. The crowds camped all night at the box office to purchase tickets. The military spectacle, a staged battle between a troop of soldiers and the local Indians, was canceled because the Indians refused to cooperate unless they could shoot back at the soldiers. The Indian ceremonial dances and parade won praises and cheers from the crowd. The cowgirls displayed their skills of horsemanship in the arena. The spectators were entertained by Bertha Blancet. Walt and Sid Seal performed amazing feats of trick riding for the audiences. The trick ropers performed fancy roping for the crowds. Roundup provided thrilling and exciting races for the audiences. Cowgirls competed in the bucking contest for the world championship. Bertha Blancet was considered one of the best bronc riders of the time. The cowboys would draw for their horses, who were saddled in the arena at three bucking stations. The contestants would often ride the bucking horses until the judges called time. In the finals, the judges could make the cowboy ride as many times as they deemed necessary to select a winner. The 1911 finals of the Cowboys Bucking Contest became one of the most controversial contests in the history of the Roundup. The crowd witnessed three cowboys of different races compete against each other for the world championship. Well, back there, there was some prejudice, as, as we all know, on, on crossing the colored line. Uh, and uh, for several years there, why these guys weren't allowed to win anything better than about a third, maybe a, a, you know, a fourth or a fifth, uh, even though they probably did the best job. 
1911 Roundup was a great show, and uh, we have a lot of history from that show. Uh, the bucking contest, the saddle bronc contest was one that uh, perhaps hasn't been equaled in time since. There was a big write-off between three finalists. John Spain, a white cowboy, 25 years old, from Union County in Eastern Oregon. John Spain was, uh, without a doubt, an excellent cowboy. I mean, he, he you know, uh, he had, uh, he could do a lot of things and was a great bronc rider. George Fletcher, an African-American cowboy, 21 years old, from Pendleton, Oregon. Apparently had a special talent and gift for training and working with horses, and he learned to ride bucking horses from from a young age. Jackson Sundown, a Nez Pierce Indian cowboy, 48 years old, from Cul-de-Sac, Idaho. He was an uh, excellent rider. He would tie his braids underneath his chin, you know, and uh, ride, you know, and you, you didn't just ride for a timed uh, amount. You rode till the horse was tired out. In other words, you, you, uh, you didn't have a 10 second ride like you do today. Jackson Sundown rode first on a horse named Lightfoot. Lightfoot twisted in circles and was biting at the rider as he pitched across the arena. until they collided with the judge's horse. Sundown was injured during his fall from the horse and he was carried from the arena. He was badly shaken, but not seriously injured. Spain rode second on a horse named Long Tom. Spain bucked across the arena and through the wooden fence. The crowd claimed that Spain grabbed the saddle with his free hand. That would disqualify him. The roundup judges ignored the crowd's protest and scored his ride. Fletcher was last to ride, and he drew a horse named Dell that would not buck. The roundup judges called for another horse for Fletcher. The judges had a lot of uh, leeway to uh, a lot of discretion to run this show the way they wanted. And uh, the next horse, George, made another excellent ride and the crowd was excited and, and uh, couldn't see why they didn't give the uh, championship to George. Fletcher saddled the next horse that was selected for him to ride. Hotfoot was the animal who pitched and bucked with abandonment. The crowd shouted its approval as Fletcher easily rode the bucking horse before the south grandstands of the arena. The roundup judges finally announced across the megaphone John Spain, first place, George Fletcher, second place, and Jackson Sundown, third place. The judges were still afraid to award the prize to either, <laughs> either uh, Fletcher or Sundown, you know, so they gave the prize to to John Spain. The crowd roared its disapproval of the judge's decision. When John Spain made his victory lap past the grandstand with the championship trophy saddle, he was greeted with warm applause. The loudest ovation came for second place winner, George Fletcher. But the crowd felt, according to the story, that uh, George Fletcher actually won the, the should have won the saddle. An interesting part of the story that George told me is that uh, Till Taylor then, who was sheriff and on the roundup board, uh, took George's hat and cut it in small pieces. So as the story goes, they got a hold of his hat somehow and they chopped it all up and sold pieces and had a saddle for him that was made for him, uh, just like the prize saddle. George Fletcher was the first African-American to compete for a world championship in rodeo. 
At the 1911 Pendleton Roundup, he won the hearts of thousands of people who awarded him the greatest honor of all, the people's champion. I won't call it a legend because most of the story is true. That everybody else has painted a little something on top of it to make it a little prettier. George uh, didn't tell everyone about that uh, ride and that contest, but after I got to know him quite well and he had told me a lot of stories and a lot of his background. He did, did tell me about this contest and uh, he was very proud of the way it went. At the 1915 roundup, Jackson Sundown placed again third in the cowboy bucking contest. Sundown was 52 years old at the time and decided it was time to retire from competition. But in 1916, Sundown decided to give it one more try in the Cowboys Bucking Contest at the Roundup. Sundown was twice the age of any other cowboy entered in the event. Uh, Jackson Sundown competed on uh, uh, for many years, and uh, in 1916, the color line was pretty well gone uh, in rodeo. Sundown rode the horse Wiggles, a sun fishing bucker, in the semifinals with a sensational style to make the finals with Rufus Rowland and Bob Hall. Sundown was the first to compete on the bucking horse Angel. When the blindfold was removed, Big Bay made a series of long, striding bucks. Sundown was riding to win everything or lose everything. As described in the East Oregonian newspaper, Jackson Sundown's long-haired chaps rose and fell with each buck of the horse. As always, Sundown's big sombrero was waving in the air. It was a thrilling ride, and the crowd cheered to a frenzy. There was a hush over the stadium. As Rufus Rowland mounted his horse, bucking Long Tom from 1911 fame. Roland had recently won rodeos in Kansas City, Chicago, and New York and was considered one of the best bronc riders in the country. The restless crowd and sundown watched Roland ride Long Tom, who could not dismount the rider. Rufus Roland made a great ride on Long Tom. And the judges were kind of contemplating about giving it to the, uh, the, the non Indian fella, see? And about that time, bing, 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 started things happening over out in the, on the arena, in this wooden arena. And some guy starts pulling a, a chunk of that arena apart, and another chunk apart, and somebody ripped up, the, ripped up one of the seats. And all at once, these officials realized that that doggone, uh, that, uh, doggone wooden stand is going to go to the ground if justice wasn't done. Justice now. I'm not talking about favorites, I'm just talking about justice. What is just? Boy. The Roundup judges reached their decision after only a few minutes of deliberation, and as they announced, Jackson Sundown, first place. The old copper-faced Nez Pierce Indian smiled and tossed his hat in the air. Sundown, sundown, sundown echoed from the 30,000 people who witnessed a 53-year-old sundown win the world championship. Jackson Sundown was the first Native American to win a world championship at the 1916 Pendleton Roundup. Sundown requested that his wife's name, Celia, be engraved on his trophy saddle. That allowed him at the age of past 50 years to go out and become a world champion cowboy. Who else could do that today? 
who else could mimic that? You gotta look at the man himself and what made him that way. All of our people were probably made that way, but there was another force, the manifest destiny, that caused that to go down. And I asked him, well, George, uh, what about other rodeos following this? And he said, well, he said after that one, he said they wouldn't take my entries into the, to the big shows. And uh, he said they, uh, they didn't want to give a contest to a black cowboy. And, and uh, he said the other cowboys and the smaller shows wouldn't compete against me. He didn't give up rodeo riding. He did a lot of exhibition rides. Another time he told me about he rode a buffalo that jumped the fence, got out of the arena, ran down uh, to the river where it got caught up in some trees and George was still on board. He was still on top of the buffalo and he felt that was the safest place to be. Well, as they both competed, it was immaterial on winning because in competition, you know, those people were, were gentlemen were brought up where there was no such thing as competition with somebody else for something. It was foreign to them. But what was not foreign to them was, was how you would be able to demonstrate your skills and prove a point, which is why they went ahead and rode. Jackson Sundown retired after winning the world championship. He made exhibition rides at Lewiston, Idaho at the request of the Idaho governor and retired to his ranch on the Nez Perce Indian Reservation in cul-de-sac Idaho where he trained young Nez Perce Indians to ride bucking horses and he also taught them about their culture. In 1917, George Fletcher enlisted in the United States Army for World War I. To France, uh, in the First World War, he joined up with a cavalry unit that was formed from cowboys around the Pendleton area. And uh, in France, he gained some notoriety because uh, they brought horses that others hadn't been able to train and hadn't been able to ride. And, and uh, George would put on an exhibition, and so he became well known there. Fletcher was wounded in the war which ended his rodeo career as a bronc rider. After the war, Fletcher settled on the Umatilla Indian Reservation and made a living as a cowboy on cattle ranches. And so he bridged that era from the 19th century to the 20th century. And it was in an era of famous horsemen, but out of all of these famous horsemen, his name always comes up as being perhaps the greatest of all. In our culture, it's, it's very important and again, I think Sundown showed that he maintained a culture. He lived within those two worlds that we have to live in today. Today, we have those two circles that we have, one, one the white man way, or Sayapo way, the other our own culture, and we had to put him in between. And we were right in the center. Sundown showed that, he, that we can live in the center, that we can live in both worlds. In show business as such, uh, you, had a, you had your own niche that racism put you into. Uh, the beads and feathers crowd, or the, the blackface comedy crowd. I understand that there's been some uh, allusion to some of the literary works that seem to want to put these people who deserve a much higher noble ranking in how they're reviewed by society today, but it seems to put them in almost a comedic type of uh, environment to where they are looked at as maybe as, as roustabouts, much like carnival people or something. I think that's, that, that's erroneous. These people need to be lionized. Again, they are, they, are, they are role models, I think, to be looked at. In 1969, George Fletcher was inducted into the Pendleton Roundup Hall of Fame. Fletcher was present for his induction. In 1972, Jackson Sundown was inducted into the Pendleton Roundup Hall of Fame. Sundown's niece was present for Sundown's induction. 
almost 50 years after his death. In 1976, Sundown was inducted by the Rodeo Historical Society in the Rodeo Hall of Fame of the National Cowboy Hall of Fame, one of 212 rodeo honorees currently inducted. Sundown is the only Native American to be honored in this way. Jackson Sundown, a Native American, and George Fletcher, an African American, were legendary American cowboys of the 20th century. History does not record Sundown and Fletcher's achievement of breaking the color barriers in the rodeo arena in the early 1900s. Funding for this production was made possible in part by Native American Public Telecommunications and the Corporation for Public Broadcasting.